<laughs> Very good. OK, I think we'll make a start. Um, <laughs> nice to have some reflections on time to get us going with. Um, so welcome, everyone. It's really good to see you. Thank you to those of you who are here with us in Penryn and welcome to everyone online on Teams. Uh, just a few housekeeping things before we get underway. If you're on Teams, please do keep your microphone muted. Uh, you can have your video on if you'd like. Um, the session is being recorded. Uh, please do use the chat on Teams as much as you want. Um, be great if you're able to just type in there who you are, where you're from. We got some people registered from all over, so we'll see who ended up being able to, to, to show up in the end. Um, those of us in the room, there's a microphone here uh, that's very good. Welcome. Uh, if we're, um, if more than one of us speak at the same time, uh, people online can't hear it, it all just cancels out. So we just have to make sure we take it in terms of speak, but otherwise it should be all right. And if you're nearer the back and you speak, make sure you speak loudly and then we can pick you up here. Um, if there's any problems, on the Teams call with uh, either the video or audio you can't see or hear anybody, then um, please just, uh, I don't know, raise a hand or do something just to make sure that um, we know uh, and we can try and sort it out. But it sounds like it's, it's all good. Welcome, welcome. I'm sorry, Mike. That's all right. So I'm sure there'll be a few more people coming in as, as we get underway, but it's no problem. We'll, we'll make a start. So um, I'm going to be presenting the seminar today, but before I do that, I just want to introduce the series to you um, because this is the fifth in our Complex Cornwall series with the subtitle Theoretical and Practical Innovations in Interdisciplinary Research. And the series idea came out of a context where increasingly research agendas, funding needs are looking at trying to tackle real world problems and real world problems are really complex problems and actually require even more sophisticated, complex thinking, particularly interdisciplinary thinking or even transdisciplinary thinking uh, to effectively address the kind of complexity from the real world challenges that we're working with. Um, and we had four really great seminars last year. Hi, Jane. Uh, and um, uh, it was great to have the engagement. We had people join us from all over the world for that. And uh, we've had some really good conversations sparked as a result. Um, so today, uh, having organised that series, I've, I've now been uh, not press gang, but like, Matt, come on, tell us your work. So, OK, you've got me today. So um, I'll introduce myself a bit more. So my name's Matt Baller and I'm a PhD student at Queen's University in Belfast, but I live in Truro. Uh, and my research, uh, my project's called Taking the Measure of High Cross, Translating the Many Worlds of Truro uh, at the Time of the Anthropocene. Um, and so uh, I'll be talking some more about some of that uh, today. Um, I'm hoping that after this uh, seminar, we can still keep the conversations going around this theme of Complex Cornwall, and then we'll have more seminars uh, to bring in over time. All right, I'm just going to double check the chat and check there's no issues. Seems like we are all good. Um, it's great to see so many of you, uh, particularly people I know, people from all over the world. We have people from South Africa and the US and Canada, um, as well as here in Cornwall and elsewhere in the UK. So that's um, that's really, really nice. Welcome, everybody. Uh, it's really good to see you. So uh, I'm going to share my screen and we'll get the presentation underway. Oh, what I didn't say was a welcome on behalf of the Institute of Cornish Studies at the University of Exeter. Uh, and some of you know a lot about Cornwall and some of you, particularly online, won't know so much about Cornwall. But we're right in the very southwest corner of the UK and have a very long and complex history. Uh, and it's a fascinating place to research. So I'm going to be talking about that, obviously, because this is complex Cornwall. All right. So if I share that and then that and then that. There. Okay. Okay, so the talk today is called Facing Gaia in Truro Cathedral Translation in the Anthropocene. 
Uh, although, interesting fact, I don't know if you saw that the vote happened yesterday for whether we were in the Anthropocene or not. And the subcommittee of the subcommittee of the Union of Geological Sciences or whatever said, no, we're still in the Holocene. So uh, there's a fight back there, you saw. Oh, then always there'll be a fight back. And yeah, but it's a fascinating conversation. So it's a contested turn in the Anthropocene. But um, anyway, so uh, oh, I don't know if those of you here went to see this exhibition last autumn. It's called Gaia and it hung in the nave of Truro Cathedral. And it's by the artist Luke Jerram, who's based in Bristol, but has exhibited all over the world. And it was absolutely stunning. It's this huge globe, which somehow projected satellite images of the surface of the earth in spectacular high definition and they had this exhibit where you could go in at night and the lights were out and it's just glowing this this beautiful orb uh although my wife did comment to me it's a little bit like when you go to ikea and you're like that that lampshade would look so great in our living room <laughs> then you get it home it's a bit big it, but <laughs> that aside it was a beautiful piece of art. It was really good. And um, the effect, the affect of being there was this sense of kind of wonder in relation to a planet. And you can kind of wander around and, and it was called Gaia. Now, before I get to the idea of Gaia, just a quick, quick note on the image of the Earth from space. So this is the image Moonrise, which was the first ever image taken from the moon in 1968 of Earth. It was the first time that human beings would seen the planet from elsewhere. Uh, and then this is the blue marble, which was taken sometime early in the 70s, I think, which was the first time the whole sort of orb was captured. And it's an incredibly recent moment in human history to have been able to see the planet from the outside. And it's utterly shaped, reshaped human imagination. Now, part of my academic research is engaging a philosopher called Bruno Latour. And he has this, uh, um, this line in his book, Facing Gaia, which says the highly celebrated blue planet has poisoned thought in a lasting way, really strong words. And I want to get into why he feels that way and how that might help us rethink Truro Cathedral and indeed think about place generally. So the, the follow up to that quote in Facing Gaia is that he says, what is certain is that the inhabitants of Gaia are not those who view the blue planet as a globe. OK, we'll try and work through why would you make a statement like that? What on earth would it mean? So just a quick bit about Latour, if you're not familiar with him, because he's a fascinating thinker. To me, one of the most important interdisciplinary thinkers of the last 50 years. He begins as an anthropologist of science and makes the case that facts are constructed. They're not just there. We construct them. But he has gone on to, be, to uh, philosophy. Uh, he's been a political theorist. Uh, he argued as a political theorist, there's no such thing as nature, as a sociologist, that there's no such thing as, so as the social, uh, and then uh, wrote this incredible text on modes of existence as a philosopher. And then kind of towards the end of his life, and he sadly died a couple of years ago, uh, that he, he really pushed into kind of political theology, which really is addressing the question of how do we avoid war, particularly in the context of climate catastrophe. Um, but really, Latour for me is anthropology. It begins with anthropology and it's anthropology all the way through. What he's always aiming at is better description. And for him, description can become all sorts of things. Um, and Jane, you'll like this at the root of all, I think, for Latour is geography, uh, because it all comes down to the earth. Everything in the end comes down to the earth. Now, there's a, a thread through his work that, in my view, is really underexplored, and that's the idea of translation. My PhD is in translation studies, so I've been trying to pick up this idea of translation in the work of Latour uh, as a way to think differently about translation and think differently about place. So just quickly, who or what is Gaia if it's not a name that's familiar to you? So it's the Greek word for Earth, 
Gaia is like a primordial being in Greek mythology, even not, not even a god, not even a titan older than the titans. Uh, this part of mythology, Gaia conspires with her titan son, Kronos, uh, to uh, uh, castrate his father, Uranos, um, uh, with whom she'd had several children. She's very unpredictable, wily, cunning, dangerous, and utterly unrepresentable, hence the insert art here. I mean, you can't represent Gaia uh, in, in that kind of Greek mythological worldview. And it's the name, famously, that James Lovelock and Lynn Margulis gave to the Gaia hypothesis, which they advanced in the 1970s. Now, Latour takes up this idea of the Gaia hypothesis, which has kind of become well known as the Earth is a, is a single self-regulating system, and the popular understanding of Gaia is if we keep destroying the planet, the planet will end up destroying us because it will just it will just regulate us out of existence. And Latour says the uh, oh, and that's been critiqued strongly by the scientific community who actually take issue with some of the, the science in thinking the Earth as a single system. And Latour says that isn't what they said. That's not what. Lovelock was proposing when he wrote the Gaia Hypothesis. So he contrasts Lovelock with Galileo. So Galileo standing there, very simple technical instrument in hand, a telescope looking up at the heavens. And through observation, he determines that the Earth is in fact a body like the other bodies, uh, and they are moving in similar ways around the sun. Well, by contrast, Lovelock, while NASA are like building very complex, expensive rockets to send off to other planets to determine if there's life there, Lovelock suggests, actually, I've got a simple instrument. I can't remember the name of it, but basically you could point it up into the sky and you could tell whether the atmosphere of other planets are in a state of equilibrium. And what Lovelock's saying is Earth's planet is not in a state of equilibrium. And we've got constant flows going on in the atmosphere, right? Constant cycles of gases, and we have the hydrological cycle. We, you, you, can, you can test the atmosphere and there's constant movement. So it's not in a state of equilibrium. It might hold stable, but that's not to say that it's in a state of equilibrium. And so if we were to point this technical instrument up at the heavens and see the other planets, and determined that their atmospheres were also not in a state of equilibrium, that would be able to tell us that there was life on Earth. So that's the, that was the kind of basic, um, basic uh, science behind Lovelock's proposal. But the contrast with Galileo is really important because in Galileo's worldview, it's a bit like the kind of world that then we've come to know via Newton, where, you know, it's like the billiard ball world. You know, you've got objects and other objects and one thing bashes into another thing and that then causes this third thing to occur. Uh, and so when we're thinking about cause and effect, we've developed this word. It is just very, very normal to us that an effect is, often really no more than the cause. And if we have a whole series of effects, well, then that's just the result of a whole concatenation of causes in Latour's language. So we have this idea that um, objects, chairs, tables, cameras, video projectors, whatever, they're just totally inanimate. Um, and we're the ones, us humans, with the agency to act because we can act with intention and manipulate things. And what Latour is wanting to do is challenge the idea that the world works in this mechanistic way and that instead objects have agency. Everything in the, in the universe has agency. An agency in Latour is understood as the power to act. So we'll come back to that in a moment. Now, the problem of spheres, I just I've got this slide because I wanted to reference the uh, philosopher uh, Peter Schluterdijk, who Latour draws on um, quite a lot in this critique of the globe. Uh, and um, there's a lot to this uh, philosophy and it's uh, too difficult to go into here and partly because I don't fully understand it. Uh, but um, the the idea of the sphere is that um, if you take the idea of a simple surface, everything is kind of neatly contained into a whole, but actually the way that spheres function in biology or in social systems, they're composed of all the agents interacting together. 
Uh, and so I quite like this piece of art because it has this sense that there's a lot going on inside the sphere um, and the sphere itself can be broken open. Um, and so when Latour is critiquing this idea of the globe through Lovelock and Margulis's Gaia hypothesis, what he's really doing is saying there isn't this single unified surface, this unified whole in which everything is joined up neatly together in one system. What there is, is a critical zone, a very thin zone, but above around where the crust is and the atmosphere is, where all kinds of agents are negotiating for stability, negotiating for their environment, making the world and the planet that we inhabit. And that is how we could think about Gaia. That's the hypothesis that Lovelock and Margulis put forward, that Gaia is in fact this constant negotiation of agency that actually creates the planet that we live on. But it's not whole. There is no whole. It's a constant negotiation between different collectives in search of their own interests and their own survival. OK. I'm going to pivot slightly to the idea of translation, and then I'm going to come back to this idea of Gaia and Latour. So um, translation studies, as you might expect, has often dealt with translation in the way that most people think of translation when they hear the word, which is, you know, English to Cornish, French to Arabic, Spanish to Chinese, whatever. It's what we have known as interlingual translation. But translation studies has also theorized translation in two other ways as well. Firstly, intralingual, which is kind of what we do when we talk across disciplines and we're all speaking English, but we don't understand each other. We have to try and translate. Or when you when I talk to some of you guys from America and I use my British idioms and you know you don't understand and we have to translate. So we, we do we use intralingual translation all the time and we actually do readily refer to that as translation. It's just not always the first thing we think of. But actually a lot of translation can be thought of as what's been called intersemiotic translation. And semiotics return, refers to any type of sign system. So it could be uh, the symbols um, that uh, it, adorn a coat of arms, for example, or it could be the semiotics of um, biological systems uh, where, um, you know, a frog sees a fly and the tongue reflex comes out, right? So there's all kinds of semiotic systems in the world. Music is a semiotic system. Uh, the media uh, that we publish on is a semiotic system. Uh, fashion is a semiotic system. There's all sorts of semiotic systems in the world. And so we can think about intersemiotic translation. Now, just a few, just some notes on a few important innovations in recent years within translation studies. So one is that Kovas Murray, who's a, a South African scholar, who actually joined us for the, um, the first complex Cornwall seminar, uh, has argued that trans, rather than thinking into semiotic, actually translation should be theorized as semiosis, as the constant movement of meaning between different, uh, between different media, between different systems. Um, and then Piotr Blomczynski has put forward an interesting argument about uh, uh, that basically shows how translation is a concept that goes by other names. And it's also a word that means many things. And it, so it becomes quite a difficult object to study. But that the roots of translation in uh, Latin languages, at least, of which English is a descendant, take translation from the idea of material transfer. The translatio is like a carrying over. So there's this material movement that actually shapes the work of translation. And so there's ways to to try and theorize translation in terms of something material that's happening and in terms of semiosis as movement of meaning um, rather than theorizing it in terms of language. The language theorization becomes derivative from the other ways of thinking about translation. Uh, and just a note on that, that um, Murray's work has particularly critiqued interlingual translation as anthropocentric. And obviously, when I'm trying to think about the Anthropocene, trying to think about anthropocentrism, um, and I have a 
critique of that work that will be published in a book edited by uh, Cobus and a couple of other people uh, that's coming out in uh, August. So the, I'll put the details of that up at the end. But if you're interested in following up further, I'd love engagement with that. So that's like, a, I mean, there's obviously a lot more we can say about translation studies, but I wanted to just orient you to that. Um, but the idea of translation in Latour is actually something quite different. And it doesn't easily fit in anything that translation studies has dealt with to date, as far as I can see. And there's a lot that we can say on that. We haven't got time for that. Um, I want to focus on a definition of translation that Latour advances in his 2005 book, Reassembling the Social, which is really the kind of main text on actor network theory for which he be probably became most famous, but which, as far as I can see, is one of the things, along with most of Latour, that's most misunderstood. And then his work gets pigeonholed in that and people don't deal with the, the great breadth of uh, philosophical engagement that he has on a number of other su subjects. So this is the definition that translation is a relation which does not transport causality, but induces two mediators into coexisting. So let me try and like unpick this this phrase. And again, just a reference um, should have been published. I'm waiting any day now uh, for this article at the bottom to come out, which is revisiting the idea of translation in Latour. that will come out in the journal, the translator. Um, in Latour's thinking, a mediator is contrasted with an intermediary. An intermediary is something that just transports causality. It's like a, it's like the billiard ball thing. You know, you're not this thing. It knocks into something else. Stuff happens. There's no there's no agency going on there. It's like it's a done deal. And what Latour wants to argue is that is that objects, beings, whether animate or inanimate, are agents, and agents have power to act. Now, it's really difficult for us to get our head around that when we think about agency, because when we talk about agency, we talk, for talk, example, for talk example. All right. oh, I think someone's got your speakers on there. You might need to just turn them off to get the echo off. Great. Uh, the, when we talk about agency, we, we might say, for example, um, this marginalised community lacks agency. Yeah, which means that they lack the ability to shape their own lives. And then we might have a very interesting conversation about whether the lack of a, the extent to which the lack of agency is systemic and the extent to which the lack of agency is a kind of psychological um, result of that experience. And what can you do to take agency in a situation? And those are those are good conversations. But they they assume a very psycho psychologized view of agency is really something like intention. But in the same way that, you know, if I back into someone in a cafe accidentally, unintentionally, and I knock their tray of drinks to the floor, I still demonstrated my power to act whether I intended it or not. In fact, as we all know, sometimes our most powerful intentions seem to get in the way of our ability to act. And so agency and intention really aren't that well linked. And Latour has this idea of agency that really all manner of different beings in the world have agency. So even these chairs have a type of agency where you all came in and because of the way the chairs were, you all sat facing this way because the backs of them are in a certain position and they actually orient the room in a certain way. Uh, the university as an object, as a being, has a type of agency that has facilitated the construction of these rooms and the installation of technology and the, the proliferation of all kinds of programs of learning and of accreditation, and so on and so on and so on. And we can even think of ideas as having agency, as kind of grasping us and doing things with us. So there's all different types of ways to think about beings and the agency they have, the power they have over us. And it's the agency of beings that is what makes those beings mediators. So rather than being intermediaries, which just transport causality, like whatever happens here, the effect's going to happen there. A mediator has some kind of power over what happens next. There's some shit. Now, it's not the same way that we might, where we, we might like compute all kinds of possible alternatives and then try to make some choice. So it's not it's not a case of saying that a chair has the same level of agency as a human, 
but it's just recognizing that there are certain things uh, there are certain properties of all beings that actually can turn them into mediators where the future is not actually predetermined and if that's the case if the future is not predetermined and all beings have some kind of agency then getting those mediators to coexist is how new being occurs in the world, how it becomes in the world, how new assemblages are made, how no, new associations are brought together. And it's translation in Latour's definition that induces that relation. And what I find absolutely fascinating about this is that that is a political argument to induce two mediators to coexist. I mean, those mediators might not want to coexist, but the inducing of them to coexist involves the negotiation. And we can think about that at the obvious levels where we imagine getting people around the same table to try and agree on something, but we can also talk about it scientifically. I mean, at the at the centre of every single atom, we know in the nucleus there's something called the weak force, which is trying to negotiate relations of charge so that the protons don't repel each other too much, uh, but don't attract each other too much. So this negotiation is constantly going on to facilitate the existence of anything at all. And I think that that's an argument, a very compelling argument, that the politics of negotiation is at the very heart of the world. And that actually provides a theoretical basis for the kind of more than human politics that so many of us are trying to reach for. We know we want to talk about more than human politics, and this is a this is a way to theorize that more than human politics, to say that there is political negotiation at the heart of all being, of all new existence that comes together, all new forms, all new associations. There's a politics of negotiation that happens. And it's translation in Latour's imagination that is what is, is what um, induces this. It's the relation that makes it possible. OK, so let's come back to this idea of the glow and Gaia. Latour says what's certain is that the inhabitants of Gaia are not those who view the blue planet as a glow. So I just want to read this quote. This is a slightly longer quote. But this is where Latour contrasts Gaia with nature. So it's useless to hope that the urgency of the threat of climate change or ecological destruction or so on is so great and its expansion so global that the Earth will act mysteriously as a unifying magnet to turn all the scattered peoples into a single political actor occupied in reconstructing the Babel Tower of Nature, capital N. Gaia is not a kindly figure of unification. No, 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 he's saying, no, no, no. It's nature. It's nature that was universal. Nature that was stratified, incontrovertible, systematic, deanimated, global, and indifferent to our fate. Not Gaia. You were talking about nature, but not Gaia. Gaia is only the name proposed for all the intermingling in, intermingled and unpredictable consequences of the agents, each of which is pursuing its own interest by manipulating its own environment. And the politics of Gaia in Latour comes out in this because what, having said that the politics of negotiation is at the heart of the world, what Latour is arguing is that uh, beings form collectives. That, that this is not talking about humans forming collectives. This is humans plus all types of other beings that form collectives in order to achieve political ends. And those collectives have to negotiate with each other. And if they don't negotiate with, with each other, they end up going to war. And this is the kind of political theological perspective that is saying by recognizing that you have adversaries, you can begin the process of peace. If you don't recognize you have adversaries, you can't even begin to do politics. 
So how does this relate to place? I think this quote's fascinating. In that contrasting idea of nature and Gaia that Latour set up, Latour says, in nature, no one has a place because no one can be rooted anywhere. No one is actually relating to a particular environment. So there I am in Truro Cathedral, and there's this art exhibition called Gaia, and it's this huge globe. And obviously I'm thinking, huh, Latour says that Gaia's not a globe, and what do I do with that? Uh, and so I wanted to take this art uh, it, it seriously in the, in the kind of provocation of it. Um, and I started to think, OK, is this is this one of those moments where I have I have to it, Latour uses this idea, the seduction of the globe That is the art piece that I'm seduced by the globe. But I have to stay alert to the fact that Gaia is not this globe. Gaia might be elsewhere in the cathedral. So I'm kind of going to tug at that thread uh, for a moment. OK, so this is Truro Cathedral for people that aren't familiar with Truro. Uh, Truro sits in a valley. It's not a very big place. Uh, the cathedral is really big in relation uh, to the to the city, which is technically what it's called. But obviously, as you can see, it's in fact a small town uh, and it's down here uh, in Cornwall, uh, right down in the southwest of the UK. Now. Cathedral is made of stone, of course, and um, most of it's made of granite which uh, was quarried literally a uh, stone's throw in, where are we? I think that direction. Uh, if you can just chuck over the road, uh, you've got the quarry there where the granite comes from, which builds the structure of the cathedral, which is what keeps it standing upright. But everything you see around the outside, all the sandy colored stone, that comes from up somewhere in uh, up near Bath. It's Bath, stone it's a limestone and bath stone was used through the 19th century very well respected type of stone um the stone for true cathedral comes from this tunnel uh this is box hill in a place called caution in wiltshire and they dug out this tunnel and they used the stone from there for all of the kind of outside of the cathedral. Now, if you've been to Truro Cathedral, you'll notice, and sorry, this is the clearest photo I could get, which is not that clear, but you can see that, the, that a lot of that stone is weathered. And it's weathered to different degrees. Even when you stand outside, you can see there's carved, this is at the, west, uh, the Western porch, this is right at the entrance. Um, there's all these different carvings. You'll, you'll notice if you go there, that the carvings are weathered to different degrees. And the research that's been done on that basically hasn't been able to draw any clear correlation between patterns of weathering and stone erosion. And so what they've concluded is the stone from Box Tunnel is in fact quite unreliable relative to the Bath stone that, was, uh, that had achieved such a good name. Now, I find this really, really interesting because in, if you think in a kind of Latourian way about stone being unreliable, then you're suddenly introducing a kind of political term. There's a, there's a kind of collective you want to make here, and one of the partners is actually starting to let you down. Now, what is it about the Box Hill Tunnel stone that makes it unreliable? I mean, it's still constructed as a limestone, you know, 165 million years ago, whatever it was, when Bath was underwater and all these organisms are slowly dying and they're going to the bottom and then they're slowly being covered in calcium oxide or hydroxide or whatever the liming process is and they form these little oids or whatever you call them. And then you, you start to have this kind of sedimentary process that forms this, this rock and eventually, more than 100 million years later, somebody comes along, digs it out of the ground, sticks it on the outside of the cathedral, and it doesn't respond at a uniform rate to weathering. And everyone says, well, that's rubbish then. <laughs> well, I mean, if you're the stone, you'd be forgiven for thinking, oh, sorry, <laughs> I didn't realise my entire life was supposed to be set up to keep your cathedral looking nice on the outside. But there's some people who really want to keep the cathedral looking nice on the outside. So they started to repair it and uh, they went to this quarry. So there's been some repairs done prior to 2005, uh, where it's just a tiny little quarry uh, in this region of France. And they pulled out little bits of similar types of limestone and patched up the outside. Anyway, the whole thing wasn't enough. They had a big project. And so they commissioned a research project that involved Sheffield Hallam University. And they've got these two chambers here because they want to test for a stone that's actually going to do the job and last properly. 
One of these chambers is a freeze thaw compression chamber where you just put the stone through cycles of freezing and thawing to simulate weather environments. And the other one is a climate uh, chamber where uh, you build the, you build a wall basically, and on one side you've got a certain climate environment, and you see what effect it has on the stone. And there's a fascinating paper, and I'm sorry I forgot to put the reference up on the PowerPoint, but I can send it to anyone who's interested. Where this is um, this whole process is uh, is gone through, and they test eight different stone samples, and they're trying to reckon with the different effects of different things on the stone. And obviously they're having to deal with the very complicated reality that you can't actually recreate the weather. All you can do, I mean, freeze thaw cycles, they go through like 200 freeze thaw cycles, but in the space of, it was like four weeks or something. So you're not talking about like 200 years or whatever. You, like, so you're trying to do your best to, to create a certain type of knowledge that's going to get you the most reliable stone. And in the end, they choose number seven, I think it is, uh, just for anyone who doesn't know where Sheffield Hallam is, it's up there. Uh, and then they get the stone from here. I'm pretty sure they didn't actually say the name, but I think I've tracked it down to the Cotswold Stone Quarries. And then they redid the western front of the cathedral with that stone. One other thing I just want to show you, this is a random industrial estate in Swindon. Uh, but this is where the HQ of English Heritage are, who set the requirements of the kind of stone that you have to put on the cathedral. So all of this is basically to say that to repair that western front after its interaction with the Cornish weather, a whole load of actors had to be assembled in a certain way and huge expense and complication and, and serious scientific work went on to try and arrange knowledge in such a way that it could organize in the tourist language politically to create a collective to keep the cathedral going. OK, so far, so sort of interesting. Now, across from the cathedral, you can see this granite pillar. Now, this granite, we've no idea where it comes from, where it was quarried, because it's very old. Uh, it's reckoned to be the uh, uh, cross uh, like a Celtic cross uh, marker. We're not quite sure what its what its original purpose was. Was it a meeting place? Was it um, a kind of marker point? Probably was both. Um, uh, back in the days where people are making journeys uh, from uh, one river estuary to another, and High Cross in Truro is actually a uh, potentially important trading place to meet and. So there's this kind of uncertain history of this cross. It's very old and it's also lost face, as you can see in this process, uh, but at a much slower rate than the limestone of the cathedral. Now, the, uh, the cross suffered its own damage in 2019 when a BMW 4x4 lost control, smashed into it and broke it into four parts. I mean, this is a cross that, as far as we know, has been there since at least the 13th century. It survived the reformation and destruction of, of crosses like this for years. It survived uh, all kinds of changes in Truro through the Industrial Revolution and all sorts. Here it is. It's made it into the 21st century. And then this unbelievable combination of different resources. I mean, we've got crude oil that's been lying under the, the, the ground for however many hundreds of million years. It's the people have now got up and then they've, they've done the fractional distillation. They've sent it off to different places. It's been combined in systems with aluminium and carbon fiber and other metals to create these engines. You've got rubber from who knows where on the tires. And all of this has come together with some poor guy who had a medical episode and lost control. And, and with a force that, I mean, it would have seemed to the original stone carvers like the fury of the gods, right? This out of control BMW smashes into this cross that survived for so long and its form is finally shattered. But friends of the cross get together, Truro City Council, archaeological societies, Cornwall Council, blah, blah, blah. They get it together, it's stored at Boscown Park, it goes off to Bodmin to some specialist carver who eventually remakes it and places it back. And again, this you've got stone that is somehow, I mean, but we're not even completely sure the original purpose of this cross, and it's sort of, nobody could clearly say what purpose the cross serves today. Uh, 
but somehow it's assembled a collective of people to bring it back and set it back to restore its form even after it's been subject to such destructive force. So I find the politics of that space on that image really fascinating because if you look at that there's no people in that image it looks like an empty space and yet huge forces huge collectives political energy is being expended to keep that that way it's not a straightforward thing to achieve now if we had more time we could start to riff on all sorts of other ways that we could think about that space I mean, the granite, for example, comes from Cornwall. The limestone comes from England. If you want to think about the cathedral and its Anglican heritage, it was placed next to this already established Methodist church. You've got Cornish Methodist nonconformism and then this great whopping Anglican, arguably colonial symbol plonked down in the middle of Truro with Edward VII, the central statue, and Edward VII is faring better against the weather than King Arthur, who is pretty much gone from the from the northern side. Uh, is the weather a political actor? I mean, there's a kind of story that's emerging, but it's not a clear story. I mean, we were I don't know how, exactly how to tell that story any more than I know how to tell the story of the relationship between Cornwall and England. You know, it's like a complex, difficult uh, echo of something that feels familiar in our discussions about Cornish identity and politics and where is the power and where is it located and who deserves or has the right or the um, or who has the means to be here. Granite itself is like one of the oldest things about Cornwall, but granite by definition is an immigrant because it forces its way up from uh, from magma underneath what's called the country rock. You know, the, the rock that really is here gets forced apart by this by this migrant granite that that forces its way in and then becomes something central to identity. So I, I suppose what what I feel about all of this is that there are stories to be told here that uh, add complexity to simple stories about a place by allowing for different actors and different political collectives to come together and particularly to think about those on multiple time scales. Uh, I will, won't talk about that because I haven't got time. OK, I uh, also won't talk about that because I haven't got time. So let me just um, conclude then with this. So the idea of taking the measure of a place, uh, just for reference of people that have been interested in my work elsewhere on the call, um, Taking the measure of is something I developed from the work of Karen Barad, uh, who has a very sophisticated engagement with theoretical physics, particularly quantum mechanics and its relation to philosophy and cultural theory. I haven't gone into that today because uh, there wasn't time uh, to do so. Um, but let me just reflect on these themes. So first of all, uh, life owes more to indigestion than sex. This is a throwaway line from Donna Haraway um, about uh, the work of Lynn Margulis, who basically was able to demonstrate that um, uh, the, the shift from a prokaryotic cell to a eukaryotic cell is basically uh, due, probably, as far as we can tell, due to the fact that two prokaryotic bacteria, in other words, single cell organisms without any of the developed organelles like mitochondria or whatever that, that could power multicellular processes. These two single cell organisms kind of got stuck in each other and they couldn't metabolize each other. And they end up in this kind of symbiotic relationship where one of them becomes the mitochondria uh, of the uh, of the cell. Um, and so biology the discipline of biology, and I, I would just say to those from translation studies who are interested in biosemiotics, a lot of the um, a lot of the theory around biosemiotics has this idea about life that one of the biggest divisions you could think about in all of thought and all of the world that we study is between life and non-life, and the definition of life in that in, in that world is is the ability to reproduce. 
It's the fact that an organism can produce offspring and keep itself going. That's what determines it as having life, as opposed to the inorganic, which might have formed, but isn't going to be able to make another version of itself. And what Margulis's idea about uh, about different organisms coming together to form life suggests is that actually life is far more entangled, identity is far more entangled than that. And that's actually really the idea of Schlotovic's um, work on spheres, is that anything within a sphere is an entangled set of relationships that form a whole. And only if we can allow for the entanglement can we actually then start to talk in any even tentative way about a whole. I think that's really important when we're thinking about how we tell stories about places, how we ascribe agency to actors in any place, because what tends to happen is that we give more credence to anything that can be clearly de defined as an individual than we do the things that actually co-constitute each other. And so, uh, I mean, we're not necessarily think of it thinking of it in philosophical terms, but we have a philosophy of identity that's very modern and individualistic that shapes so many of the conversations that we have about everything. And if we allow for, for identity to be co-constituted, um, we have the capacity to think differently about that. OK, the next ones, let me just rattle through these. Space is active. Grateful to you, Jane, for putting me on to Doreen Massey, who's a human geographer, who's written this fantastic book on space called For Space that it is always being made, it's not a container. So when we when we look at this uh, image here, this is not a container for things to happen. I, I think the St. Piran's Day Parade ended here yesterday, or you know, lots of things end in this kind of space or stuff happens here, but that's not the only way to think about it as a space. Constantly stuff is being produced, is being made, stone, micros, bacteria, people, cars, all sorts of things are making this space continually because the matter of the world is always happening. Uh, and so spaces are always being made in, in a plural way, even in one place. The other comment is that time is plural. It's much easier to think about times, I think, when we're talking about place than it is about time. We talk about the geological time of these rocks. We talked about the last 100, 200 years of history with the cathedral. We could talk about the present and our experience there. But all of those times are wrapped up in each other. And all of this takes us to the idea that every place has many worlds. And this is an idea that I think takes quite a bit of work to really get under the skin on, of, and we don't have time for that. But um, I just want to make the comment that uh, a lot of the talk of worlding relies on Heidegger's idea of worlding, but it's very, very human centric. So in the discipline of biosemiotics, for example, there's a great reliance on Jacob von Uxkill's notion of Umwelt, which is the idea that every organism arranges its environment, has its own world, and those worlds interact. And so then we start to have ecosystems. But because of what I'm saying about life, that life is actually not just this division between what we call organisms and what we say is inanimate, that actually we can think about worlds more broadly than just what we've traditionally wanted to put under the heading of biology um, or organic. That actually stones have worlds, uh, cars have worlds, uh, because they are agents, and every agent in Latour's language, and I agree with this, uh, has a world, uh, and, the, and in order to describe that world, we need to allow for space to be constantly making and for times to be plural. And so the final part of this is that because everything I've said so far in one way or another has been said by somebody else, uh, maybe not the stuff about the cathedral, so I'm bringing something to Truro here, but I also want to bring the, the perspective of translation, and I haven't been able to talk as much about that as I might want to in another context, but the idea of translation, particularly as Latour develops it, and I then try to read that through Barad's theory, um, is a process, I argue, that shifts the focus onto the relations by which a place is continually made. 
So there's lots of talk already about the relations by which a place is continually made. I think thinking translationally about that helps us with that focus and particularly because it attends to the relation of shifting worlds. If we think about translation as a relation that's inducing mediators into coexisting, then these new worlds that are being made are the result of translations that are occurring. And in order to be able to try and engage with the differences between worlds and the ways that those worlds come together to form political collectives that are in the cause of preserving the cathedral or in the cause of doing away with it, as the weather is, uh, then actually translation gives us a way to think about worlds and to um, attend to the relation between them and that therefore it is a theoretical route for thinking more than human politics. And that's the thing that really animates me in the research is how, how do we think politically beyond the human in ways that allow for different conceptions of our of the of the um, worlds that we're inhabiting together. So uh, that was uh, my reflections on facing Gaia. Yeah. Good, good. OK, so we've got a bunch of people online who have been uh, commenting, I think, just introducing each other. Um, so I want to make sure that we've got space for questions from the room here and also from those of you on the Teams call. Um, so if you've got a question on Teams, maybe you could type it in the chat um, and then we can just try and moderate those. Um, so in order to give you a minute to do that, I'm wondering if there's someone in the room here who's got a question or response that uh, you'd like to make. Yeah, I'm just going to uh, dive in on. Um, so you talk about Karen Barad, and so just if you and you talked about the weak forces in the atomic nucleus and that negotiation there, do have you then therefore gone into mind as a property of matter and all that kind of quantum biology stuff? Is that inside your thinking? Yeah, so I think that one of the um, it's a difficult question to address. Simply, I think one of the problems we've got with quantum physics is it's like. Quantum physics came, came along and everyone went, oh, that's like a lot like Buddhism, you know, or it's like so you kind of make these like very simple uh, or, or it's like uh, all our sci fi dreams have come true because like we can just teleport to somewhere else or and so what Barad is doing is a much more sophisticated uh, engagement with with because she has a PhD in theoretical physics. Um, and the the one of the difficulties with it, so that the, the issue is that uh, matter and therefore being is produced as a result of measurement and that uh, and via an apparatus. And the apparatus is uh, is not limited to some piece of technical equipment. Uh, so there are whole, so Foucault talks about apparatuses in his um, analysis of power dynamics, for example, in the prison system. So Barad is bringing Foucault's analysis together with Niels Bohr and his experimental you know, measures that um, determine the position or the momentum of an electron, where otherwise they're actually not determined. They're not anywhere. Uh, they're in a whole load of places at the same time. If you want to take that up to a question of scale, um, you can say that the whole world is a quantum world, but the dynamics of the system regulate that quantum behavior so much that you know, if I were to stab my finger on that table right there, there is a theoretical possibility that my table, that my finger could go through the table. It is possible, uh, but I could spend my entire life doing it and it probably won't happen because the probability of the energy within atoms, all of those atoms and my finger being aligned in such a way that in the moment of a human lifetime that they would align so that I could get the finger through the table, it's not going to happen. So. When we get up to biological systems, what's happening a lot of the time is that quantum uh, quantum effects are not that visible, but there is a field of quantum biology. And um, I make that argument in the paper I cited, in the book chapter I cited. Um, but it, so you can see it in photosynthesis, for example, you can see it in the migratory patterns of robins, for example. Um, that, uh, and there's work on mind um, where, it's, it, it, you know, people still haven't figured out how the brain works. It might be that quantum processes are powering the brain. So I think there's a lot of legitimacy to that. Um, 
I don't think any of that needs to be true. It is, uh, looks like it is true, but I don't think it needs to be true for Barad's argument to be really valid, which is that at the deepest account of matter that we have, being is constantly produced intraactively through its entanglement with other agents. And so you can't say the reason that this thing is not that thing is because it occupies a different different coordinates in space and time. Uh, because actually things can occupy different coordinates in space and time and be the same thing, have the ide same identity in every conceivable way you could look at it. And so we have to think about how do we create separability differently from spatial separability? And even Einstein struggled with this. I mean, he still stuck to spatial separability and could never get over it. But really the quantum the quantum age has shown us that there, and this is Barad's argument, there has to be an agential separability. So even if spatially things are taking up the same space, there is a, there's an agential separability that means that you can say that one thing is this and another thing is that. And I think that chimes really strongly with Massey's argument that there are many, many things happening, many worlds, many histories um, and multiplicities in one place and that space is not um, uh, limiting in that sense. So uh, that was a bit of a riff, but so that's why I think the mind argument is interesting, but it's not necessary to say the fundamental point I want to make about place, which is multiple worlds of recurring in one place. And that that's how we should think about being generally as, as, as a multiplicity and think about agency rather than other forms of separation. Okay, let me check the. Okay. So somebody's commented, um, does experience fit into this anywhere and memory? And those are great questions uh, that I have been thinking about. But I don't feel I've been thinking about them enough. Um, uh, so. I'm trying to, it's obviously not a lot to the question, so I'm trying to infer what's being meant. What, how I've thought about that is one of the difficulties is if we talk about experience, like if I talk about my experience, I'm talking about me, Matt Valor, uh, and my own psychological, phenomenological interpretation of the world. And I can only talk about that because I got a memory. And so I'm laying down phenomenological experiences that I'm interpreting. And, you know, so that when I see Joni again, I'm like, hey, Joni, and you know who I am and I know who you are because we've got memory and experience. And that's what makes our being in the world feel meaningful and that we're not gone crazy. Like, we, you know, we're not sort of, we're not lost some touch with reality. Uh, and so if we're going to talk about the, if we're going to talk about the stone of the cathedral having agency, for example, um, I don't think it's it, 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 it's difficult to say that the stone has memory or experience in the way that humans have memory or experience without doing some kind of extreme level of anthropomorphizing, um, which might be useful. And um, I just in that book chapter, I also discuss anthropomorphizing in relation to anthropocentrism because there's an interesting dialogue between uh, the Babette Tischleder has between Latour and William Faulkner about whether anthropomorphism helps us recognize the agency of objects or stops us recognizing the agency of objects. And there's a good argument on both sides, because if, if you over anthropomorphize, you basically don't let the object be the object. But if you don't anthropomorphize, you don't empathize with the object and try and see the world from its point of view. Um, but I think that there is a broader question then about where experience and memory actually are located. And are they fully contained within my brain? And most neuroscience, as I understand it, is pretty clear that my memory is very, very unreliable. And I've created all kinds of fictions to facilitate my being in the world. Um, and I'm sorry to break it to you, you all have as well. And actually, our, our sense of self is more like a mob it's more like a murmuration of, of starlings uh, where the inside and the outside is far more porous than our sense of our skin as a boundary allows. 
and that we're shaped far more by what happens outside of us than by what goes on inside of us. And I think in that sense, there is, uh, it raises the possibility that um, the secularized worldview has made a very big mistake in allowing us to be super individuals and not allowing for other something being, I mean, some people called it God. That's not the language I want to reach for because of other issues. But I think in Latour's world, that, that idea about life that indigestion, you know, I'm saying indigestion has been more effective than sex, uh, bringing about life. There's something in that worldview, I think, that allows for a kind of animism. Uh, and that animism is to say that there is, there are, there are beings existent with a TS, that shape our experience of the world. And in uh, Latour's, probably his main work, An Inquiry into the Modes of Existence, he talks about uh, something like 13 different modes of existence. And some of those, are, they're, they're all beings that shape us. And some of those, it, it, it sort of becomes this kind of quasi-religious animism uh, because, and, and he, it's difficult because if, it's just difficult to make that case in the modern academic environment. But I think that what I find compelling about his argument is that he makes a really strong case for how you would have to do away with the alternative. And so then what have you got left? You, you, you've got to make space somehow for some kind of collective experience. And I, I think we're way off being able to have the language in our 21st century world for for talking about that and that that's what's leading a lot of researchers particularly in the us to look to indigenous traditions within north and south america for example because they have a much stronger animist um heritage uh, but translating those into the kind of world that we've now found ourselves in there's a lot involved in that so i don't know if that was really the question that was being asked but that that was what it made me think of Joni. Hi, I'm just think, kind of, thanks for that. It was really, really, really interesting and really, really thought provoking and I'm doing an awful lot of digesting. Um, but um, uh, I just ended up thinking a little bit about kind of like fluidity and meaning making and stasis and stuff. And on the one hand, you know, you've got this rock that has been in the ground, whether 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 we're talking about the um, uh refugee granite or whether we're talking about the sedimented um uh limestone bathstone whatever um that uh that's that's matter that's sort of been in the ground it's been in stasis for a you know for a very very long period of time and then but then you've also got like the fluidities about how it's been sort of dug up and manipulated but about how that's also attached to kind of to to human anthro you know, anthropocentric meanings mm. or yeah yeah it got dug up because humans wanted to build a cathedral yeah yeah yes yeah. so. yes you've, you've got this matter that's kind of that that really wants to be static but it's mobile now it's static again but it's manipulated i don't know i don't know where i'm going with it but it's kind of i don't know I, yeah i mean so uh, uh, yeah i agree and i think it's um the way I've tried to think about that is to think about it in different temporalities. And I think that's interesting to pop for politics, right? Because if any of us are involved in political parties, for example, as soon as you get involved in a political party, you realize that you can't actually do the politics that you really wanted to do because you have to do something much more short term than the long term things that you're actually interested in. And that's the pragmatic question. And Jane, in our second seminar, explored pragmatism as a as a research method. And I think it's really, um, it's something I, I don't really know exactly what to think about, if I'm honest, because there's a, because pragmatism, it seems to me, operates within a certain time scale that says there are some things we need to achieve. There are some things we need to take seriously about where we're at right now. And so we're going to respond to those things. But there's a different way of looking at the world, which says there are longer timescales. And those timescales are also political. They just arrange actors and collectives in different ways. And so from the perspective of the granite or the, or the limestone, I mean, probably 
even if humankind as a species lasts, you know, a million years into the future, I mean, there's going to be a chunks of granite that, are, I mean, will have been and gone and they uh, barely have noticed, you know, in, the, in, the, in their in their political collectives, the things that, that the granite, and, and granite, by the way, of course, is a composite being of many, many other uh, crystals and minerals and whatever, that in that political collective, um, the humans are only just one little part of the story. Um, uh, and, you know, that cross that's outside the cathedral, I mean, it's spent a good amount of time under the place that eventually became NatWest Bank, and they only found it because they dug it out when they were doing the digging the foundations for NatWest. Um, and it, it had been forgotten about before then. So it, it was quite happy, perhaps, just back lying under the ground. Um, so I, I think there's something about thinking temporalities that allows us to maybe take, say, OK, this is one of those times where we're just going to think about the humans or we're going to particularly focus. We're going to have a human lens on things without having to say that, therefore, all the lenses that we could ever think with and our fundamental philosophical positions on the world are driven by a human centric approach. Um, and I think if we're able to navigate that, we could have a more than human politics that's a kind of theoretical foundation. And then from a pragmatic point of view, we could say, OK, we just need to talk about some humans today. And that might be a, a very legitimate thing to do. So that, that might be a, a way to frame. OK, Jane. Yeah, you've been making me think about lots of things, but I'm not sure I've got a question, but just a comment. And that is that it strikes me lots of the ways in which we're talking are about our ontology, aren't they? That how we think about the world in which we live. And there's lots of ways in which philosophers, you included, are trying to make us think about symbiogenesis or this co-presence, this co-constitution, this coexistence. Um, so I love Margulis's work about symbiogenesis. It's absolutely brilliant. Everyone should look at it because she's basically arguing that the human being is is a community of organisms and we only function because of the bacteria in our gut and our, everywhere else on our bodies that produce most of the chemicals that we actually require for our biochemistry to work but it's only in the recent times that we've even been aware of our codependence if you like and our co-responsibilities for the organisms that make us function as human let alone Everything else around us, you know, it's such a complicated world. Like you're saying, all these things are so complicated and they're so co-constituted. Mm. So it strikes me that all these philosophers, in a way, are trying to get us to think about our ontology differently. If it's Barad, if it's Latour, if it's Massey, if it's Margulis, they're all actually on the same territory. Um, and then the question comes, well, if we think differently, about our world on the basis of this ontology, what do we do about it? So this is where some of the pragmatist philosophers are really helpful. So Richard Rorty, for instance, was onto this very early in that it's not about a real world out there. It's about the stories, the narratives that we tell ourselves so that we see a particular kind of world and then we act mm. in a different way. And it strikes me that facing Gaia, in, I am getting there, facing Gaia in Truro Cathedral, there is lots of day. I didn't really understand what Latour is saying about the dangers of seeing Gaia or seeing the world. I'd like you to say more about that. Mm. Because for me, one of the big things is the danger now is people see Gaia, they see the planet, and then they launch into another load of absolute crap because they're not thinking ontologically properly or or they're not their ontology is such that they think there is still a simple mechanistic world out there so in a way we've got different ontological stories being told and the danger of the Gaia thing is that we're now launching into net zero so what we're doing is digging up more stuff producing more and assuming that net zero is going to be some kind of solution it's such a human way of behaving that we think there's an easy solution to things mm. so I'm wondering whether the Gaia in the cathedral is about thinking more carefully and more modestly and more humbly in relation to our storytelling so that we stop messing up quite so badly. Um, yeah, OK, thank you. So I think there's two things I'd want to say about that. So firstly, stories. Absolutely. So that's actually where my research lands is trying to tell different stories. Yeah. Um, and to allow for the presence of multiple stories in one place that aren't necessarily easily resolved. 
and require some difficult translation to induce coexistence. I think the idea of the globe is the idea that you could have a whole, a universal, um, you, could have, uh, you could have peace on earth. Uh, and for Latour, peace on earth would only be achieved if we would actually be able to name the collectives by which we are convoked, in his language, and find peace negotiations which are complex and difficult, difficult to achieve. Right, it's not, it, so it's, it's a, allowing for the fact that there's always negotiation going on. And if you recognize that, you can, you can increase the chances of figuring out how you could negotiate, but you also maybe need to name your enemy and be, and be prepared to acknowledge that this collective is an enemy. And I think the problem that, it, it's a very difficult thing to work with because obviously what we have is a very, um, significant history in the last 500 years in Europe, even the last 100 years, of some very powerful people naming an enemy very, very effectively and then uh, going after them. And um, we don't, you know, the, we don't want an argument like this to lead us to fascism, right? But I think that what we, what Latour is cautioning against is a reaction the other way that says that basically everybody could just be one happy family and um, we can all just have universal human rights and everything will basically be fine. Uh, and if you, if you, the, um, Latour, in order to understand that critique of the whole, you have to understand Latour's critique of mo modernity because the modern for Latour is this core concept and the modern is birth after the English Civil War. Uh, and he even traces the, uh, the birth of, um, of the kind of way of thinking that he describes as the modern to an argument between Hobbes and Boyle over the political implications of a heat pump. Uh, and it's, it's Hobbes who you know, births modern politics, right, with, um, with Leviathan, which is basically a response to the English Civil War, that how do you stop people killing each other? Uh, how do you create some kind of politics that can actually mitigate uh, against this violence. Uh, and the, the problem with it in, in Latour's reading, and he's following Carl Schmitt as a political theologian who also has some problems associated with it. So Latour's trying to be careful with that. But essentially, it's the idea that, it, that politics has been established by general norms. So we just have these general norms. And, um, and that, argues Schmitt, takes the politics out of of everything because there's no there's no way we're allowed to disagree anymore there's no like actual negotiation going on and so by reintroducing politics like real politics into the world then we can stop having this pretense that everything is one big globe and we can actually get down to the detail and ethics i think for latour in the end is all about detail how do we get down to the detail of what's happening and what might need to happen. And we don't need to speak for everybody when we attempt to, to do so. Um, I think it's quite a, a challenging thing to contemplate, but I, I also look around and think our existing political institutions are failing us very, very badly. And we need a different way to think politically if we're gonna, if we're gonna navigate a future. Um, okay, we're almost out of time and there are some other, um, questions on here. In fact, there's loads. Sorry, people on Teams. Give me one second. Um, oh, I apparently experience came from one person and memory from somebody else, and I've put them together, hopefully in an interesting way. Uh, okay, there's a comment here. I'm just going to read it um, from Matt Baker. I sense a certain pragmatism here in the sense that while much of the discussion clearly does have an ontological basis, it is the political material concern that is most urgent, and that entails a kind of agnosticism in terms of any fundamental unit of ontology. Or it says, are we going along with Barad here in how uh, for Barad phenomena are that basic unit? And so if so, how does that help us understand what you want to say about translation? You're describing a dynamic world of signs. Uh, can you say more about how these pieces fit 
together. Um, yeah, good. So Latour has, um, let me, I think I've actually got it. Oh, no, I've got it here. Yeah, I have this quote that I wasn't going to read, but I'll read it now. So when Latour talks about Gaia, it wants to say instead of the glow, instead of Gaia as a glow, Gaia is a, is a zone, a zone of translation. Uh, and in this, in this quote, it's calling that as a zone of common exchange, a metamorphic zone. And he's saying it's a property of the world itself and not only a phenomenon of language about the world. And he goes on to say signification is a property of all agents in that they never cease to have agency. For all agents to act signifies bringing one's existence, one's subsistence from the future towards the present. They act as long as they take the risk of filling the breach of existence or else they purely and simply disappear. In other words, existence and signification are synonyms. As long as they are acting, agents signify. This is why their signification can be followed, pursued, captured, translated, formulated in language, which does not mean that everything in the world is simply a, a matter of discourse, but rather that every possibility of discourse is due to the presence of agents in quest of their existence. OK, so that's like a, that's a challenging paragraph, I accept. Uh, but I think, what's that? It's Barbenheimer. Right there. Barbenheimer. Yeah. Barbie. The, oh, Barbie. Barbenheimer. Sorry. Barbenheimer. Colliding. That's, okay, that's, that is, that's what that is. Okay, that, that's some cultural commentary. Okay. Um, so, in terms of translation, so just to say he uses the word translation there in a more colloquial sense, which is confusing when I've talked about its technical meaning. Um, but this idea that exist, a, a, agents act, and that simple act of existing signifies that's part of how Latour is able to say to, or part of why I think Latour wants to use the language of translation to talk about the induced this relationship that induces these mediators to coexist because there's a signification that's going on so I, I think uh, uh, like one way to answer your question, Matt, to talk about Barad and phenomena. So Barad wants to say the basic ontological unit, if you want to put it like that, is a phenomena. There aren't things. There are phenomena because um, things are too bounded. It's, it's, we're over uh, any to talk about anything is basically an approximation. It's basically a, there's a phenomena of space time matter happening. I think if we read that with Latour, what we get is that space time matter happening, this phenomena is itself a signification. It's an a, it's an agentive act that is taking a risk to fill the breach in existence. That is a good theoretical physical account of of matter. And by doing that, it signify it's signifying something. And that signification is then immediately involved in some kind of translation, translational process where some new agent, some new association, some new collective with all of its political implications are being formed. Uh, so I, I realise that's that's quite a complex set of ideas there, but I think that's how Barad and Latour kind of come together in, in thinking translationally in, in this sense. I hope that's helpful, Matt. Um, I th think uh, that we are okay. He says perfect, so that'll do. Um, uh, I think we are. We're nearly out of time. Are there any other questions here? Yeah, question here. Yeah. Yeah. So that that was that was really exciting. I loved it, and and I actually I actually think you are doing a lot with memory, because it struck me that you were kind of reperforming the stone's sort of performance of memory if you see, if you see what i mean oh, okay I wondered whether i don't know whether any performative inquiry whether you've delved into that or no not, but it it just struck me that we're often so tied up with grappling especially with text and with language things that are very sort of immediate and fixed to us um but kind of those 
absences, the stuff that we don't think about, like the geological formation of the stone mm. and the people that dug it up and so on. And so there's a performing of memory there. And I don't know, with, it's difficult because it almost language becomes our hurdle in thinking about translation, doesn't it? Mm. But whether performance and I don't know, just that other way of communicating, translating, we need we need to kind of think in that kind of way. Yeah. Part of that negotiation piece. Yeah. That's really helpful. Yeah. And I think this is this is one of the questions I have is sort of, I mean, it, you know, this is like interesting philosophy. And your question, Jane, was it's sort of in the end, like, what's what's the point? Yeah. Uh, and and I think the um the so story is where I want to get to. Uh, because I think that if we can tell different stories, we can reshape our politics. And I think what you're saying is really interesting there about, you know, how, how might you go about a storytelling process, you know, the, um, yeah, and and the performative thing's really interesting because it's the because performativity has quite a lot of connotations because we think about performance, we also think about cultural performativity of identity, and for Barad, um, performativity is, goes all the way down. I mean, every electron continues to perform. That's her. That's Barad's version of what Latour is saying there about agents taking the. The risk of filling the breach in existence to think about it performatively is to then allow ourselves to not have to think about it representationally it's like we don't have to say um okay we have a representation of this thing that we can then talk about it actually can happen it's constantly happening and each time it's happening it's new and that is what memory is uh it's a, it's a constant happening um but to translate the memory of the stone i mean i really like that like what what's the what's the happening of the memory of the stone like now uh yeah I, I, I have to think more about that yeah it was really nice and very engaging as as, as a result so mm. maybe we should perform perform more perform it <laughs> yeah right right yeah yeah okay nice yeah question at the back just super quick i know we're all set time i loved it that it was pretty great so thank you um who's your audience like that's something i'm really interested about this kind of work right like, it's really great it's fascinating um, it's incredibly deep, rich, but who is telling stories for? Who are you tell stories for? Who would you like to? Yeah, that's a nice question. And I actually wrestle with that a lot, as you can probably imagine. I mean, I actually came to this because I um, I started a storytelling project in, in big cities around the world. And it was trying to think about how communities could have more agency over their lives in particularly what might be unspoken border zones. Uh, and Pursuing the theoretical side of the work uh, has now, several years on, sort of taken me into this whole other uh, sort of philosophical journey. Um, and so I think I, I am interested in how people, how we could, you know, how could Truro, for example, think politically about his future? I mean, we have Truro City Council, you know, and it's like some people working really hard, in many ways doing a great job, but very, very limited agency over Truro. Uh, Cornwall Council doesn't have a lot of agency over Truro. It seems to me increasingly even central government doesn't have a lot of agency over Truro. Um, who does? Uh, wh where is that? And how? And certainly residents of Truro don't seem to have much agency over Truro. So I think there's a kind of question of how could, how could there be a, a better kind of experience of living in Truro. But I think if we're going to have that question at the time of the Anthropocene, we're, we're also having to recognise that we could we could somehow fix loads of things and have really great conversations tomorrow where we like make Truro a great place to live. And then in 20 years time, we have an economy that doesn't function and we have uh, climate uh, effects that are making things much more difficult. And and really, those things are already happening, and that's part of the reason why it's so difficult to, to fix the things right now. So it's it's kind of, and I don't know why I said the word fix because I because I think that even the solutionism approach to that is not it is not a, a good response to um, to Gaia. Uh, so uh, I, yeah, I think there's something about how do how do we allow for for uh, political collectives, um, and but I think that yeah, who, who's the there's obviously an academic audience to this, but in terms of like how it gets out, um, I think I'm still wrestling with that. As I appreciate the question. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy for advice. <laughs> I'm just going to check on here. Um, 
we're almost out of time. Uh, okay, there's a really nice question here from Julie saying, I wonder what you think phenomenology fits into this. Thank you, Jane. Um, and I, I think that probably is related to the question of experience I was reflecting on earlier. I think if we we can think human phenomenology in terms of nervous systems and uh, neurocultural phenomena and that kind of thing. Um, I think we can use our imagination to think phenomenology of objects and collectives and ecosystems and and so on in a, in a different way. But that requires quite a lot of imagination. Uh, I probably don't have anything more to say at this point. I'm, I'm aware we're, we're at half past. Um, Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Thanks to everyone online for joining. It was really nice to have so many different types of people join for this seminar. So um, uh, no details as yet of a complex Cornwall 6, but um, I'll keep you posted. And uh, I'd love to have any feedback, anything you want to um, uh, find out about. Um, if you're interested in the two things that um, I published or they should be published soon, uh, then those references are there. Um, thanks very much, everyone.